everyone, my name is João Figueiredo, uh, aka Joe, and welcome to the Art and Business How to Turn Your Passion into a Profitable Career course. So here we are at the beapromuser.com, or maybe you're watching this at Udemy. My goal with this course is very simple. I want to show you the strategies and tactics that help me go from nothing and coming from a small town outside of Lisbon in Portugal to a business owner, a music school owner and a coaching agency owner in the United Kingdom living the life of my dreams. Here's how I did it. Let me start with context. I was born in 1986, like I said, in a small town outside of Lisbon and my whole family, everyone's a teacher of different things. My mom uh, taught science for, for many years. My dad is still a teacher. He teaches um, arts and uh, is an architect as well. So, you know, my grandparents were teachers. My cousins are teachers. Everyone's a teacher. Why am I saying this? Because that's my passion too. I just so happen to teach music and to teach entrepreneurship and to kind of blend those two together and teach musicians how to be entrepreneurs. Makes sense, right? I started learning music in 1990. I was very young and you know, I took it as seriously as any other four year old would take music lessons. Not really all that seriously. Uh, I was having fun, I was learning, but the learning was more of a passive uh, activity, was more of a collateral effect of enjoying myself and, and playing a musical instrument. Before I knew it, I, I had been playing for 10 years now and I started seeing the world differently and I wanted to experiment with more and more things and I got involved in different uh, art forms such as uh, filmmaking, uh, you know, making songs, uh, writing music and in 1999 I took my first trip abroad uh, after being invited to be part of the film festival if you will in France and C to be more specific. So I was invited to go there because I had been involved in filmmaking and uh, maybe I was okay at it. So I was invited to be a guest judge at that festival. Needless to say, I was 13 years old when this happened. It was mind blowing and I learned a bunch of stuff. I learned that, you know, it takes a certain level of detachment and this is really where the course starts. It takes a certain level of detachment to survive an experience like that at such a young age. And by detachment, I don't mean to not care about anything, but to not hold yourself back because you need a physical connection to what's comfortable. Comfort is not a bad thing. Comfort should also be let go whenever it gets in the way of you progressing and really expanding your horizons. Something else that I also learned is that there are no days off if you're an artist. When I was abroad, I mean, my notion of time changed because my routine was over. I wasn't going to school, of course, so I mean, weekends and uh, days off and, you know, working hours, they just, they were random. <laughs> I mean, and that's something that is very valuable because a lot of people hold on to that idea of routine and they really need things to make sense and they need things to be in a certain way and that's not necessarily bad if we know how to channel that but if we are looking for a nine to five job as a musician good luck now long story short it's now 2008 and this is the year i became a music teacher um i was going to university and in all fairness i was fed up i was fed up of not really learning anything that i found useful i was learning how to draw and paint. Um, no, I'm a musician. So I dropped out, I left and I moved on. So now I'm uh, back in my hometown, that small town that I told you about. Um, and I find myself not having a job, uh, I'm not studying anymore. And I'm just basically hanging out. So now it's been a week since I dropped out of, of university and I'm going to this new 
um, music shop and I was just hanging out there because I knew the guy who worked there and one day I'm just outside uh, you know by the door and one of the owners comes to me and asks me kind of out of the blue uh, hey buddy uh, can you read music and I was like yeah I can uh, and he goes like do you want to teach drums yeah I do and there you go I got a job I'm now uh, doing the whole waiting game because they were trying to find students and the reality is immediately I went into, into entrepreneurial mode and I'll tell you why because I didn't have a salary I was paid accordingly to how much I taught so I started looking for students I wanted to get paid so now they were looking for students and I was looking for students needless to say we found students. A year later, I was invited to become a partner in the business and I accepted the offer and I started and I became effectively responsible for the education side of things. But unfortunately, things didn't work out and uh, I felt like my priorities as an educator weren't being respected and they weren't really, yeah, whatever. It didn't work out. So in 2010, I left and I decided to open my own music school, which was like a mile away. Um, I did that, uh, some of my students followed me, but some didn't. And now I was uh, teaching at my house, at my parents' house, really. So, you know, no overhead costs, dream job, right? Uh, I was chilling. So I was just finding students and kind of fine-tuning my marketing skills and understanding how to advertise and I remember that I would go out at 1 a.m. and just put up, put posters up on bus stops and stuff like that. I mean, I would print them off at home. I had no money to invest in advertising. It was all guerrilla marketing. I loved it. It taught me so much. It was all about grind and hustle. I mean, I know that these are words that I used lightly, but this is exactly what I was doing. I'm not gonna lie, I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. The scalability of it is quite limited, but that's a fundamental process uh, or step in this process. You have to suffer, you have to get your hands dirty. So now it's 2010, 2011, I'm running this school, I open a second school. These are all very amateur schools, by the way, we're not talking uh, anything like what I have now. Um, there were kind of these recording studios that I converted into music schools. Anyhow, I was learning how to run businesses. I was learning how to manage people. Then eventually I decided to hire stu uh, teachers. Uh, so to teach different instruments, guitar, bass, singing, you name it. I was expanding and I was getting excited about it. But at the same time, it was really difficult to scale it because I didn't have proper premises. It was kind of, it was rubbish. Okay, like I was learning how to run a business, but that wasn't the business that I was meant to run, basically. And in 2012, I decided to call it and I left Portugal. I moved to Dubai and I went there to work for a music school. So I was teaching there um, drums. And also what I wanted to also learn was how do real businesses work because this school had like eight or nine schools in Dubai alone. They were growing super fast. I kind of saw what was going on. But the problem was when I landed <laughs> and I realized that it was all a big scam. They, they're just mistreating people, uh, teachers included, sometimes even students. Unfortunately, I had a contract, so I couldn't really get out of there as quickly as I wanted to, but I learned a lot whilst I was there. And one of the things that I learned was that, again, suffering is a big part of this process. Um, it was some of it unnecessary suffering, but most of it very enlightening and very... Let, let's just say that there were a lot of teachable moments. But... In 2014, I decided to leave and uh, went back to Portugal. Uh, actually, 2013, it was December. Uh, and then, in three months, 
I moved again, left Portugal again, and I land in the United Kingdom. So now this is February 2014. And here I am in London, not knowing anyone. I had a couple of friends, but my network wasn't really <laughs> great. I started going to job interviews uh, to, be, to be a music teacher and work for other people. And I, I realized quickly that there, there was a gap in this market, which was high level education for all ages. Like colleges and universities are good, but then there's a problem when it comes to private education. Usually it's not great or, you know, of course there are great teachers out there, don't get me wrong, but as a system, as a, a whole, it's all right. So I decided to open my own space. Nine months later, it was open and it was called the Lizrum Academy and that's exactly where you are. So when I opened the Liz Drum Academy on February 7th, 2015, I learned a very important lesson that would help me throughout the rest of my, till now, entrepreneurial career, which was, the difficult becomes impossible the day you stop trying. A lot of people get disheartened by difficulties and obstacles and they just give up. They can't handle that, that feeling of failure. And they don't even fail because they, they stop even before they succeed or fail. So if you want to succeed at anything, you're gonna be willing to fail. You have to be willing to go all in, do your best every day, push harder, outwork everyone, and then remind yourself that the difficult becomes impossible the minute you stop trying. So it might be difficult, but it's not impossible unless you stop. So opening the Lee's Drum Academy also gave me a, a massive opportunity to meet and work with incredible musicians because one of our missions or, or our main mission in the first year was to bring the best musicians in the world to Leeds, to, to this academy, to provide the high quality education that I was really aiming for. So we did that, we hosted master classes with some of the best drummers in the world practically every month. From Thomas Lang to Aaron Spears, JP Bouvet, Klaus Hessler, Pete Lockett, Dave Major, Rob Hirons, Ugo Denin, they were all here, you name it. But more importantly, what did I learn from these people? I learned that everything is possible, I learned that hard work always pays off, I learned that you have to be incredibly skillful in order to achieve mastery, so your foundation must be so solid, otherwise it's just not going to be possible. I learned that social skills are very important. All of these people that I worked with were just incredibly humans. They were humble, they were super professional, they weren't messing around and no one was like, let's go party, let's get drunk. There's no rock star mentality. They're just professional, they're serious about what they're doing. They don't take things too seriously, so they, they are easy to hang out with and, and have a conversation with. And that taught me a lot once again. It showed me that if I keep pushing, if I keep doing this, I might get there myself. So I kept doing exactly that. The big question though is, how do you achieve that? Well, it's quite simple. You have to stop around. You just have to, you have to plan. You need a business plan because you have to know what you want and what do you need to achieve what you want. And that's one of the things that I talk about in on different courses at the bpromuso.com website is, is how to write those business plans and how to actually do it in a way that is not just a list of your dreams and hopes, but an actual business plan. But if you don't do this, odds are you're just going to be drifting, you know, and get lost at sea because there's a lot of people wanting to achieve what you want. 
So what's gonna make you stand out? Is it, you think that uh, because you you play really well that that's gonna do it? Unless you're a super genius, but even then, even if you are a super genius, you might have a hard time making it because marketing plays a massive role into it. So you need to know what your margin of error is. You need to know what your plan B is. And I'm not saying like a different career. I'm just saying like what could be a different approach to achieve the same thing. How will you steer the ship back if something goes wrong? You need to know all these things. You need to rehearse it. You need to plan ahead. Don't react. Anticipate. The best advice I can give you right now is that you stop dreaming and you start planning. You see, the difference between the dream and the plan is that the dream lives inside your head. I mean, it's just something that you visualize. And I'm not saying that visualizing is bad, nor is dreaming. The problem is when we don't materialize those dreams. And if you don't, effectively, they are not plans. So a plan must live outside of you. It must be something that you can look at. That's a plan. More plans. I write them all down. So I'm going to ask you. I want to test your ability to plan and I want to make sure that you have been planning your life. So what's your plan for the next year? I'll give you a minute. You can say it out loud if you're by yourself or you can just think about it. Now, what's your plan for the next five years? And I'm not just asking what do you want to achieve in five years. That's easy. That's easy to come up with. Oh, I want to have a million pounds or I want to play in f with Alicia Keys. That's easy. We can all dream. What's your plan for the following five years though? As in, what, what are the steps that you will take in the next five years to achieve whatever your dream is. And finally, what is your plan for the next 10 years? Again, not just goals and, and hopes. What's the process? And if you know the answer to all these things, the next question is, do you have these written down or are these just living in your head? Write them down. So let me tell you exactly how I went from homeless in London um, to a business owner in Leeds still in the United Kingdom well one giveaway is that I moved to Leeds that was one of the smartest decisions in my life because you know like London is a great city no hate but it's very expensive it's very difficult to to create a startup it's just it's just difficult and as much as I appreciate difficult I also appreciate achieving things and I know that it would be a suicide mission if I kept trying to do it in London or I would have become someone else's employee and really you know have to subject myself to someone else's standards <music> So the trick was, first of all, I moved to Leeds. That was my first business decision. Second of all, I had a clear vision. I wanted to open a drum school that would provide the highest quality education ever seen in Leeds, if not in the UK. That was my vision. Third, I was very willing to never rest. I was very willing to never take a day off. I never, never, ever went out for drinks, ever, still to this day. I've never been out for drinks ever since I moved to the UK because I don't take breaks. That's it. <laughs> No, 
now of course the next question is how do you measure success a lot of people ask this and they are and they debate this a lot like oh i don't measure success uh, you know by looking at money i don't measure success it's all about happiness <laughs> and okay uh, let's get things straight that's no <laughs> all plans have a price tag doesn't matter what you want to do you have to know the cost of it you're just gonna get lost if you don't basically and you're gonna constantly make mistakes because you don't know again how much it costs to achieve what you want and you're just gonna keep on pushing towards that direction but all those missteps will lead to either bankruptcy or you having to find a job that will take all your day and then there's no time to pursue your dream so what is the cost of your dream you want to practice all day all right how much does that cost how much do you have to pay the studio to go there and practice all day or how much do you have to pay your house like your rent and your utilities and whatnot so you can stay at home and practice there's always a cost do you want to become a session musician okay so how much does that cost how long will it take until it pays off, until you can pay off the investment in becoming a session musician. You want to study at the best universities in the world. You want to go to Berkeley, you want to go to The Collective, you want to go to all these fantastic places. Okay, how much does it cost? And how are you going to get there? Are you just hoping for divine intervention and suddenly you got a check in front of you for a million? Reality is, if you don't know the cost of your plan, you might find yourself not being able to afford it. You have to plan for the costs as well, not just the dreams. So one of the things that I hear a lot now that I've achieved a certain level of success, um, you know, I've been living in the, the UK now for three years um, and I'll get into what I've achieved since moving here, but one thing that I hear a lot is, oh, it's easy for you to say. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> because it's not luck. It was a system. A system of discipline, organization, grit, patience, you know, self-motivation. And even when I, I doubt myself, and I still do, I still bring myself into a state of mind of what's my vision, why am I doing this and what am I supposed to do next? Because if you bring momentum back then you know the ball starts rolling and you're good to go. But it's all about being organized, right? So you know I wrote and I still do write business plans for all my new endeavors so I know exactly what the cost is and what I have to do to cover those costs. Uh, I write to-do lists, I write not to-do lists, I have deadlines, I impose deadlines on myself and I get really annoyed when I fail uh, and I go over those deadlines. What's the cost of an opportunity? How much does it cost to make a decision? Let me explain. Recently I started a partnership with a local music, well, local, a national music shop, they have a chain of shops. Uh, called PMT here in the United Kingdom um, and that, that partnership was fairly straightforward uh, we print, printed out these vouchers uh, that they would give away to customers who spend more than 30 pounds in anything so how much that sounds like a, a, an interesting marketing campaign I mean it, it's not overly complicated they hand the vouchers out easy but how much does that cost? How much does that decision cost? Because that voucher is also a discount. So we are losing effectively 40% um, because that's, that's a discount on the student's first month of lessons. But we are attracting that customer into the, the school. So can we make that back? Yes. But how long will it take? You need to calculate that. So that's you calculating your ROI return on investment you need to know what that is otherwise you know how much do the, co do the vouchers cost to print all these things must be taken into account calculated and then as you look at that cost and you know the cost of that decision now you 
can make that decision or not, or pass and come up with a better plan. Now, in the midst of all these decisions and all the things that you can do and can't do, there's a big question. How do you say yes to certain projects and how do you say no to other projects? How do you know which ones to say yes and no to, basically? Well, I got kind of a system that I come up with. So here's what I do when it comes to making decisions and how I decide if I say yes or no to a project or a partnership, whatever. So I kind of, uh, I started by basically saying yes to everything. So I, I just had no criteria. My goal was to do as many things as possible, as much as possible so I could learn. Eventually I developed this sort of pyramid idea or triangle. Let's go with a triangle. So you have money, project and people. Okay. So I went for a two out of three kind of approach. So if the money was good and the project was good and the people were eh, I would say yes. If the project was good and the people were good and the money was not great, I would say yes. And if the people were good and the, pro the money was good, but the project not so much, I would say yes. So that was my criteria for many, many years. Nowadays it's more of a, I gotta have three out of three. So the money's gotta be good, the project's gotta be good, and the people have to be good. But it takes time to kind of raise your standard like that, and it's okay. So remember, start by saying yes to everything, you know, as long as you don't get yourself in trouble or whatever. But then, eventually, progressively go for, you know, one out of three. Choose things like according to at least one of those parameters and make the conscious decision of maybe saying all right I have one project that it's all about just making money, you know, a function band or Whatever, it's just a corporate gig um, Then have another project on the side that it's all about the project So the music is incredible super challenging and it's really teaching you and then another project where you don't care about uh, none of that but it's all about the people because maybe you're playing with your friends and you just enjoy yourself. So maybe you have those three projects going on at the same time, right? Because that, that, well, in a way, it covers all your bases and it teaches you uh, the value of each one of those things separately. Then eventually go up to two out of three and then eventually, like I said, three out of three. And then you're golden. You're just doing exactly what you want to do on your terms with who you want and being paid for it. So all of these learnings and lessons led me to where we are now. So it's 2017 and I recently decided to expand my then Leeds Drum Academy, my drum studio here that where I'm shooting this video and we've expanded and took over uh, more space and now we have more rooms and now we are effectively the Leeds Music Academy. So, what did I learn doing that? I learned how to manage people, or I'm still learning, but it's already been quite a learning curve because when I say manage people, I don't mean that in a you know, controlling way, but I really want the teachers who work for us and the staff that works for us, uh, and we now employ roughly 15 people, I really want them to share our culture. So it's very important that you know exactly what your vision is, because otherwise it's really difficult for you to, well, pass that on to other people. And even if you are very clear of what your vision is, well, you have to make sure that they are too. So that was one of the lessons. Like, it's, it's still a, a, a process that we are going through, um, but I believe that um, we are getting there and the, 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 the team is getting stronger and stronger because they're starting to understand that the culture of the company is what wins all. Not me, not them, it's the culture, it's the vision, it's the standards, it's our own goals. So that, that's been quite an interesting learning curve because, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience but diligence to that mission of you know sharing a, a mission and the culture with 15 20 people 
hundreds of people, the more the company grows, the more important this is. Now, let's get into the good stuff. How do you turn your passion into income? First of all, uh, I would say that it's crucial that you know why you're doing what you're doing and that you remind yourself regularly of how it all began for you. And why am I saying that? Because it's easy to be doing corporate gigs and fun uh, working with function bands and uh, you are effect effectively playing a musical instrument and you're making money. But is this why you started playing music? To play music that maybe you don't even like, it's definitely music that you didn't write, to people who are not even listening. I doubt it, that's why you started. So keep on reminding yourself of why you started, because that's gonna push you towards a direction that will actually allow you to feel fulfilled and accomplished. And yeah, you have to know why you're doing this. Don't just go with the flow of things and just start thinking about money. Remember, two out of three, three out of three, fundamental. Now, it's also important that you find your market. So what does that mean? I mean, let's say you want to be a session musician. You want to be, you know, a recording artist. You, you, let's say you are, you are a drummer like me and you want to just do studio work. I know a guy he, uh, local here to Leeds who does a lot of studio work and he does it really well. He, he's an incredible musician and he really found his market. So what does that mean? First, you have to define what your ideal client is. You really need to be very clear on this. Write it down. Who's your ideal client? What kind of person are we talking about? What kind of music are they into? What kind of money are we talking about? How much money are they willing to pay you? Are they going to be the ones who, you know, all constantly try to negotiate and cheapen you down? Or are they just people who respect your craft and pay accordingly? Write it down. Become obsessed with that idea of who's your ideal client. Then define what's your ideal job. What kind of studios do you want to work uh, at? Um, what kind of music do you want to record? Do you want to be um, a chameleon and just play all genres? Well, then you have to ask yourself, are you capable of that right now? And that's ultimately the, 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 the point. Once you define your ideal client, once you define your ideal job, you have to make it happen. So you're gonna have to then trace back the gaps, the, the holes in your game that are not allowing you to achieve those jobs or to go get those jobs and, and work with those people who you consider to be your ideal client. Once you identify those gaps, those holes, like I said, then it gets a lot easier because you can start addressing them. You, you get better. So for example, let, let, let me give you a very practical example. Say so you want to be a recording, uh, a session musician, um, but and you want to do a lot of um, session work, of course, and and you know that every now and then the phone rings and maybe they'll be like, uh, "Hi, Joe. So uh, we've got a Latin project here. Can you play some drums on it?" Well, if all you can play is rock music, you're gonna be the guy who says no, <laughs> not the guy who says yes. So you have to figure it out. You have to practice. You have to go learn how to play Latin. You got you gotta go take lessons. You have to find a mentor because you gotta become strong at that at that skill of being a chameleon. On the other hand, if you don't want to do any of Latin or jazz or whatever, and you really just want to stick to being a great rock drummer who's a session musician, well then you need to be a master. You can't just be the middle of the road kind of rock guy. You can't play rock the same way the chameleon guy plays rock. So you gotta raise your own standard to a point where it's just, it's so undeniably good that then you can get away with the fact that you only play rock. A 
Okay, so the next uh, thing that I want to talk about is how do you promote your work? So this is something that I, I find crucial to talk about because a lot of people, in fact, don't know how. <laughs> and they waste a lot of time on social media without even realizing how important social media is. So let's talk about that. For example, I want to address five different platforms and give you a little bit of insight on each one of these. Um, first and foremost, YouTube. YouTube is currently the biggest platform when it comes to music, video, movies, TV. YouTube is ginormous. So to not capitalize on YouTube is just insanity. So what I would advise you to do, first of all, is say you are a musician, you play in a band, create your own music videos. To make a music video nowadays doesn't have to be a super expensive task. So do create music videos, loads of them. Then create behind the scenes videos. Then create lyric videos. Then create exclusive content for your super fans. It's not exclusive at all, it's on YouTube. But you get my point. It's about creating some hype. You can go live on YouTube nowadays, so you can show your fans uh, how you prepare before a gig, literally, behind the stage, literally, looking at the stage. You can stream live your gigs. It doesn't get much better than this. It's the 21st century. It's so freaking easy. You just need to do the work. Do vlogs, do, uh, uh, you know, a documentary on your band. You can do it all yourself. You don't have to wait for someone else to come along and, and be like, oh, we want to do a documentary on your band. Don't wait, do it. The second platform, I must admit, this is the one that I know about the least. And I'm not a super, super fan of it, but I use it, which is Twitter. So Twitter for me is all right. I guess I'm just, um, I like to write. <laughs> so I, I like to have room to write. So Twitter, you know, the 140 characters limit, it's just a little bit off-putting for me. But I do use it, and my team uses it as well uh, to promote my projects. So one of the things that uh, I use Twitter for is to uh, share little quotes and thoughts and the pictures and the video. Because the video is cool, because they give you a long time, actually. Besides Facebook and YouTube, Twitter is actually the one that allows for the longest clips. Um, and then, okay, so the segue would be Facebook. For me, this is the tool that I use the most. I use Facebook to post um, my own blog posts, if you will, articles that I write. I use Facebook to post video. I use Facebook to, po to go live. I use Facebook to... I use Facebook ads. So I advertise my businesses on Facebook. I use Facebook pages. I use Facebook groups. I use it all. So then I, I would actually I would say that Facebook is very important you should definitely have a Facebook page um, and you should definitely use your personal profile as also a business page and the business profile so I wouldn't really rely on, on any social media really to you know share a side of your life that you don't see beneficial to your work it's important that you you learn how to live your personal life and expose your professional life don't don't conflate those two too much anyway you know i share some stuff every now and then like every five weeks there's a picture of my son on my facebook everything else is just work 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 not in the sense of spamming for me it's all about value so i i share a lot of content that i believe that is valuable to people so uh, that's what I do with Facebook. I would definitely advise you to get into that and the, one of the courses on the website is really how to master social media. The other uh, platform would be Instagram. Again, I don't use it a lot personally. Uh, my team does. I personally am not a super fan of just pictures, I guess. Uh, I've never been one to take pictures of anything. <laughs> but um, Instagram is very powerful and uh, Instagram Instagram stories are interesting and I should definitely uh, learn more about it and I will and one of the things that we will be doing is that I will be inviting guests who are really experts on social media to run some of our courses alongside with me so keep an eye out finally Google and in this case Google Plus and um, 
And for me, Google AdWords. Google AdWords work still okay. You just need to know how to use it. So if you want to promote your band, um, Google AdWords are okay. If you want to promote your business, if you are a service provider like a teacher, a music teacher, or if you run a, a rehearsal space, then you definitely need uh, Google AdWords. Because you need, first of all, to improve your SEO ranking. So that's something else that we will also discuss. But you have to, to you know, get yourself out there. And Google AdWords is a great way to just, you know, get right to the top. Now, you have to be prepared to invest some money on advertising. I mean, you just have to. So it's I plus V equals O. That's my formula for success when it comes to social media. And this stands for input plus value equals output. So don't just spam. Also make sure that you put a lot of stuff out there, that's the input, but that has value. And that will for sure give you some output, something that you will you know, take home with you, that being money or awareness or whatever that might be. Your ROI will always increase if what you do has value. So your return on investment, uh, you know, if you put five, uh, uh, you know, pounds or dollars a day into advertising and you take away 15, you've won $10. That's not a massive ROI, but it's profit. So you want to keep on pushing that and scale that by providing more and more value. So the more you do that, the better. I would also advise you to optimize as much as possible. So that's what the money is for. I understand that at the beginning there's no money and we have to go a little bit more guerrilla on things. But as soon as you make some money, grab a, at least a percentage of your profits and a, invest that into automation of your business because you want to be able to work and you can't work you can't practice you can't play you can't teach if you have to be posting ads every single freaking day or if you have to go out and hand out leaflets or if you have to go out and put posters up it's just not doable you will you will never be able to scale your business to a point where you actually make some solid money if you have to be doing all those things yourself so invest 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 Finally, my last piece of advice is turn off your phone and get to work. I hope you guys enjoyed the, the course and as always, if you have any questions, ask away. I'm here to help. Um, info at beapromuser.com is the email. Go get them, guys. <laughs>